Hey, happy campers. Todd here, Great American RV Superstores, and we are in front of our fifth wheel that is a Heartland Bighorn 37FB. We're going to do a technical walkthrough on this unit just like you would on the date of delivery with your technician. We're going to be doing a walkthrough with some of the components on here. If your components differ from what's in here on your Bighorn, you can find those components as well as other components and a deeper dive into those components on our Great American RV YouTube channel under the playlist, Haps Helpful Hacks. We're gonna start here in the front. Of course, we have our seven-way plug. Our seven-way plug will plug into our truck that we're towing with. That is gonna transfer all of our lights for our vehicle to the trailer. And we're also gonna have a charge line in here that is gonna go to our battery and help keep that charge while we're traveling down the road off of the alternator of that truck. Now on here, we're also going to have from our brake controller through here, to our brakes, that brake control line, that will activate the brakes while we're traveling and we initiate that brake system. We're also gonna have our breakaway cable here that's going to lead to our breakaway box. We need to make sure that pin is inserted at all times. That way our brakes aren't active whenever we don't want them to be. Then we're gonna have this loop right here. This loop needs to be hooked somewhere, maybe on the rails of the fifth wheel hitch, never on the hitch itself. What it's intended to do, if anything ever fails on the hitch or the kingpin, this pin right here is to be pulled out whenever it disconnects and it's gonna activate the brakes on that trailer and bring it to a safe stop. This is only gonna work if we have a good 12 volt system on our fifth wheel. If we have bad batteries, that safety system is not gonna work. All right, in our front left compartment, just under our kingpin, we have our center where our hydraulics, bunch of electrical, everything is. It's a spaghetti nest, right? So when you come in here, we're gonna start with our hydraulics. We have our hydraulics that run our leveling system as well as some of our slide outs with the exception of that front one. Uh, so our hydraulics are going to operate off of that keypad and our switch. The system is 12 volt controlled. You do have a 250 amp inline fuse in this system that is going to be located inside of this box. And in the event that that pump is not operating, that's one place to check. You're also going to have an inline 12 volt fuse down here. This one happens to be down at the bottom. It's a little blade fuse. Uh, nowhere specifically do they mount it. You just have to follow the wiring. Another thing about our hydraulics is we do have that tank down there at the bottom. That tank is filled up through this inlet right here. And we only want to check the value of this tank, the height of that hydraulic fluid, when everything is retracted. So our slide outs are retracted and all of our jacks are retracted. If we fill this up without retracting everything, when we do retract it all, it's going to overflow and make a big mess in our compartment. So keep that in mind when we're checking our hydraulics. Up here is our inverter system. An inverter changes 12 volts to 110. So this would be if we're boondocking somewhere, we don't have a shore power plug in, we would have our inverter powered on that one switch is in that front compartment we'll show you later. You do have a GFI outlet right there on the side. In the event that it is not working, you can check there and see if it is tripped. You can hit that reset button right there and that will reset that outlet. Below your inverter, you're gonna have several disconnects. This one right here would be for your solar system. One of these is going to be for your inverter and the other one is going to be your regular battery disconnect, okay? So your battery disconnect is going to disconnect that battery right here. You have two batteries in this storage center that will disconnect the power from your camper. We wanna use this when we are not plugged into shore power because it will drain your battery otherwise. So that'll conserve some energy on your battery when you come back out to operate it. And anytime our unit is plugged in, we pretty much wanna have all these disconnects on. As long as we're plugged in, we're not pulling any juice from that battery. You do have this little toggle switch right here that controls the lights on your front cap. Here we are on the driver's side of our unit. We're gonna go over a few things over here. In this front compartment on each side, you'll have your propane storage. You have a tank on each side. So we also have a dual propane regulator that is gonna operate for those tanks. On that regulator, you do have a selector switch. You can choose this tank or the other tank to be your primary. When that tank runs dry, then the indicator on there is gonna show red and it's automatically gonna start pulling from that other tank, of course, assuming that your valves are on. That way it doesn't interrupt your LP service on your unit. When that secondary tank runs dry, well, you're empty. 
We can go over, if we notice that that primary is empty, we can swap over to that secondary tank. Your indicator should change if you have an appropriate level of propane in there, and then we can get that other tank refilled or swap it out. In our next compartment, that is our pass-through bay. We do have our uh, LCI electronic control leveling system. That is for our hydraulic jacks. We'll go over the operation on that here in a second. We also have our pre-wiring bracket right there for power for the Lippert tire monitoring system. If we want to purchase that upgrade, that's where the monitor will go and then you put your sensors on your tires so you can monitor your tires while you're traveling down the road. Behind that, we have our convenience center for all our water hookups. We'll go over the operation of that as well as our hydraulic controls right now. All right, so here we are in our control center. We have our spray port. We hook that cool quick connect in there. We'll have hot and cold water spray port accessible outside. We have our three ports right here. One is going to be for satellite. One is going to be for cable. Our cable would come from our park cable, obviously, and all these ports run to the inside of our unit everywhere we have a TV, including our exterior. Now here we have all of our connections for our city water, the different options for our knobs here. The white one right here, that is our city water connection. That's where we'll run the hose from the campsite, hook it up to provide water to the interior of our tank or fill our tanks. So we'll move to that. First off, we'll touch on city water. City water is just if you have that connection at the campground, we'll go ahead and turn our valves to that sequence right there, and that water will go straight to our faucets. If we are wanting to dry camp, the first thing we'll need to do is fill our tanks. So we'll go to power fill tank. Once again, we'll have a hose hooked up to a water bib to fill that. And we're changing our sequence to that. And this will begin to fill the tank on our units. We have that onboard storage for our fresh water. This is for if we are going to a campground or stopping anywhere on the road and we want water and we don't have a water source, we'll come and fill that tank and then in order to use it we'll turn to that dry camping sequence turn those valves to that and then we'll turn our water pump on and it will pull from that tank and provide water to our system our next one is winterization all right so we'll turn those valves this way for winterization and this is for when we want to winterize our unit for the winter time and protect our pipes so we would first go to our low point drains which we'll talk about the location of that a little bit later. We'll open up those low point drains, blow the water out of our system, turn our knobs to this, and we'll hook a hose from here and put it into a gallon of RV antifreeze. Now, we'll take several gallons to fill this unit. So you do it one at a time, you turn that water pump on, and you open up all your fixtures in your unit until antifreeze comes out, you swap that jug out as needed. This changes that system up to pull from that antifreeze jug and fill that system. The last one is siphon sanitize via tank pump. Now that system is if you want to sanitize your tank system, basically same concept. You're pulling from here with a mixture of water and bleach into your system if you want to sanitize it, but it goes into your fresh tank. So as we were saying, this is our city water connection. That's where you'll hook that hose up. This one is our black tank flush. This is for when we are flushing out that sewage tank. That's where you'll hook your hose up here and kick that water on to flush that tank out. We'll go over a little bit more information on that when we get to our actual black tank dump valve. On this system, you will have a second black tank flush because there are two black tanks on this unit. All right, moving down the way here, up under our front compartment right there, that pass-through compartment, we have the valve for our black tank system. And that is going to output right here on this valve, on this opening right here. Right here below this sticker, we have our gray tank one. We can go ahead and open that valve. That'll be for our uh, gray tank one system. Another connection right here, because we have two bathrooms in here, we have our black tank valve right there, and we have another gray tank valve right there and another outlet. So you will have to have the dual hoses. You wanna get that Y connection so they can both dump into the same dump station. So let's go over what our tanks are and how we dump our systems. So we have to have our sewer hose connected, obviously, and we have to have our outlet at the campsite or a dump station. Our gray tanks on both systems are going to be from our sinks and shower water, stuff like that. Anything from the kitchen sink, bathroom sink, and bathroom shower, it's all gonna go into our gray tanks. Our black tanks, however, are going to be sewer water. That's everything that goes into our toilet. 
So our gray tanks, as long as we have that hose connected, we can have our gray tanks open all the time, let that water drain out. We don't have to worry about coming to open it up whenever it gets full. We leave those open, let them drain out, of course, as long as we have a source to dump it in. Our black tanks, however, we need to keep those closed until we're ready to dump. Reason why is those solids inside there can dry up and be impossible to clean. So that's gonna become a big issue for you. So we wanna make sure we leave those valves closed until we're ready to dump. We always wanna leave several gallons of water in there as well. So we'll go through the process. When we're ready to dump, we have our hose hooked up. We open our black tank valves, let everything that's in it go ahead and drain out. Then we're gonna hook up to our black tank flush over there, hook that water hose up, turn it on, and that's gonna start running water through that system into that tank. Little spray jet's gonna help spray it down and push it towards this valve and empty it out. Now, that's gonna do a pretty good job. You can go a step further if you like. This is a pro tip, and this is completely on the customer to try it, but if you do, fair warning, if you overfill your tanks, that's on you. So just a little pro tip advice here, but it manufacturers suggest to do it the way I just told you to do it. If you want to, you can close that black tank valve, let it fill up with a little bit of water and open it back up and flush the system. But you have to monitor your tanks if you're gonna do this, because if it overflows into your system, we are not responsible for it, only you, okay? So uh, number one, you don't wanna have that overflow problem. Number two, it's just, you know, I know a lot of other things go into picking up, just make sure that we're not walking away from our system and letting that tank overflow but it is an easier way and more helpful way to flush out the tanks in your system. Uh, once we get done, turn off your black tank flush, close your two black tank uh, valves, and then go over to our toilets on each tank, on each toilet, and hold that pedal down. You wanna add several gallons of water into your system, and then you wanna go ahead and put chemicals in there. Do this, number one, so our solids, anything that might be left in there doesn't dry up and that system gets stuck. We are gonna have some stuff still get on our sensors. While we're driving down the road, that water is gonna help slosh that stuff around and the chemicals are gonna help decompose anything that's left in there. We only wanna use RV toilet paper in our systems. That way it decomposes properly and we're only putting sewage down there, nothing else. We wanna treat it kinda of like a septic system. We don't wanna put uh, any other products in there, just our sewage, our toilet paper, and our chemicals. Anything else may get clogged up in those drains in there and cause you a lot of issues down the road. You're also going to see that red and blue line down there at the bottom. That is for our low point drains. We want to drain water out of our system and start prepping it for winterization. You can see our front slide out right here. We have some cables on each side, two, one on the top, one on the bottom. That is a cable driven slide out. If you want more information on that slide out, we do have it in our helpful hack section on the Great American RV YouTube channel. The other two slide outs on the unit are going to be hydraulics and work off of that hydraulic pump in the front. We notice we have a vent over here. This is for our vent over the hood, that stovetop vent to exhaust out. There are two tabs on there. We need to make sure those are unlocked so the air will actually ventilate out. But when we want to store our unit, it's suggested that you go ahead and close those tabs so no insects or rodents can make a nest in there. Under our underbelly right there sticking out, we will have a blue pipe with a valve on it. Remember that onboard water storage tank we talked about in our front control center? That's how you drain that out. That's added extra weight to your unit, so if you don't need it, drain it out. And also, if you don't need it, you don't want that water getting stagnant in there, so just drain it out and leave it empty. Well, on the back corner of our unit, we have our 50 amp twist lock plug right here that's going to provide us with shore power. And we want to insert that, turn it to the right, to click it in, and put that little retainer ring on there that helps to make sure that cord isn't gonna be pulled out and make sure that we don't have a gap in that uh, the power cord to the plug and we don't cause any electrical arcing on there. On the rear of our unit, we can see that we do have a receiver hitch on there. That receiver hitch is not rated to tow a trailer or anything behind us. Otherwise, we'd have hooks and lights and stuff back there. It's just for like a carriage or anything that we we'll wanna carry behind us. Up top, we are pre-wired for that Furion backup camera system. If we want to add that on there, the wiring is already there for the power. And we'll also see our bracket up in the top right. That is for our Lippard ladder on the go system. If we want to gain access to our roof, then we can buy that telescopic ladder that will extend out and attach to that bracket and gain access to the roof. We do need to do that because after trips, we need to check our roof, make sure we didn't hit any low-lying limbs or anything and cause any damage to the rubber on our roof. 
We also need to clean and maintain it, and we need to check our sealants on the roof as well as our sealants on the sides, around our trims, uh, windows, lights, anything like that. We need to check all these sealants every 60 to 90 days. This is maintaining our unit and is considered customer responsibility. We need to check for any peeling, cracking, anything of that nature, deterioration of that sealant. If there is any deterioration, cracking, or peeling, we need to clean that off and reseal it. If we don't do that, we can open the door to leaks and, and decomposure of our unit, and manufacturers aren't going to participate in any repairs if we're not keeping up with the maintenance. So just like changing oil in your car, you need to maintain your unit so it'll last for years to come. All right, so on the passenger side of our unit, we have that front storage center right here that is for our other LP tank. We have our pass-through storage right here, and we have our solar control center. That is where our solar panels right there, that power comes down to that controller and it turns it into charging power for our battery system. We can monitor that there. We also have a connection for our outdoor TV as well as a GFCI protected outlet there and here. We wanna plug griddles and so on and so forth in there. If those outlets aren't working, we're going to go to our main GFCI uh, outlet on the inside and reset that. We'll touch on that a little bit later. Just keep in mind, these are GFCI protected outlets. We're also going to have a little button in here. Uh, that button is for our inverter system that we talked about in there. It changes power from 12 volts to 110. We would go ahead and kick that on if we want that inverter system to work. And that is, once again, if we are boondocking and we don't have shore power. Down below our 110 outlet down here, we'll see a quick connect for our LP system. If we want to get an outdoor grill, hook it up, we can use the propane off of those tanks in our front compartments. Here we have our suburban tankless water heater system. This is an LP operated device that'll give you endless hot water. We'll go over the operation of that when we get to the controller on the inside. This will exhaust out of here and it will get a little warm, so just keep that in mind. And this is our suburban furnace to go ahead and keep our unit warm. Same thing, LP operated device, and it's gonna exhaust out right there. On our entry door, we will find some resistance when we open and close that door. That is because we do have friction controlled hinges. That's to help keep the wind from slamming that door open or shut, and banging against your unit. You do have the solid steps right here. These solid steps can be stored pretty easily by lifting them up. We'll put them into the frame of our door. We need to pull that little blue latch right there to make sure we are allowing that latch to go around our frame. Give them a little tug and make sure that that is set in place properly and our door closes properly ready for transport. We're ready to set them out. We want to auto level our unit first and then come over here and do our steps. We pull that blue latch. We can go ahead and drop it down. And the reason I say auto level is because we also have to level out our steps. In order to do that, we can push this little silver latch right here and we can shift those legs in and out so we can level our steps. This is important not only for safety, for getting in and out of that unit, but we also want to make sure that our threshold is down enough to where this door is going to close properly. And we also want to make sure that our frame of the door isn't hitting the frame of the steps and causing any damage. So make sure we auto level our unit first, and then we go ahead and level out our steps. Of course, you have your little grab handle right here. This is extended out. If it was extended in, it'd be in, and you'd have this pin down at the bottom. You pull that pin out, pull at the bottom, grab this, and you slide that back out. You can stick your pin in right there to put it back, push right there, and reinsert your pin. So that's a nice safety rail added feature on there to help you get in and out of your unit. On our unit, we have our 12-volt powered awning as well as our 12-volt awning lights. Both of these components controlled by our battery power. We can, if we have any issues with it, we can go over to that 12 volt fuse panel. We'll show you on the inside, check the fuses and make sure that nothing is blown. Now the important thing about our awning is we need to pitch it. We need to make sure that any water that gets on our awning is able to run off. We can either pitch it to the back or the front or over here at the back because these steps are here and it's a lot easier to reach. Easy to do, we go grab it right at this pivot point right here and we just pull down that gives us a little pitch on our awning for that water to be able to drain off. 
Now we're talking about AC runoff from the condensation on that AC, uh, light dew or light rain. If there's a rainstorm, you need to roll that awning in. If there's a wind, high, high winds, you need to roll that awning in. This is to keep you from having an insurance claim. If there's any damage due to the awning collapsing because of too much water on it, or if there is a wind that rips it off, anything like that, number one, it's very difficult to take all this stuff down after that happens. Number two, it's an expensive insurance claim. Manufacturers are not gonna participate in that kind of damage. So make sure we're rolling our awning in. If we leave our unit for an extended period of time, another great time to roll it in just to make sure nothing happens. When we're ready to store our unit, we go ahead and pitch it back up and then we can roll our awning back in. All right, so the first cabinet, as we walk into our unit, we're gonna see our control center. This is where we can see our levels for our battery, our fresh tanks, gray tanks, any of those systems. We'll push a button, we'll see lights light up and give us the level meter of those items. Down here we have our tank heater, our tank heater here and here. This is going to be a 12 volt mat that is attached to our tanks to help keep them warm during cold temperatures and prevent them from freezing. Here we'll have our 12 volt water pump. This is what's going to pull the water from our fresh tank and supply it to our water fixtures in the event we don't have a city water connection. If our tank is empty, we wanna make sure we cut that pump off. If we don't have any faucets or anything running, then it's best to turn that pump off if you hear it running constantly. It means you have a leak or something else wrong with the system. You can cause water damage. If you do have a leak and you still have it running, and you can also cause that pump to burn up. Here we have our water heater option. This is our 120 volt or 110 option for a heating element. We kick it on if we're hooked to shore power, we wanna use that option. If we wanna use our LP, we kick that on and our DSI fault right here, that direct spark igniter fault would pop on for a second until that system lights and then it will go off. Now, if we have a fault with that system, it will kick back on or never turn off and we want to just first turn that system off, kick it back on and see if that fixes the problem. You might have some air in the lines. Otherwise, turn the system off and have it checked out. Our main light switch right here, that's going to control our living room area. And then we have, of course, our entry light right above our door and our awning light outside. We have our slides in and out and our awning in and out right there. This slide out button right here will control our bedroom slide all 12 volt operated options right here. So if we have any issues, wanna to go to that 12 volt fuse panel that we'll show you here shortly. Now in this particular unit, you will notice you have another set of tank levels right here that it that is for the other black tank. So your bottom one has your two gray tanks and your other black tank, this is for that second black tank. Here is your suburban tankless water heater controller. We'll kick it on. That red light means that it is on. We can change our temperature with our arrows right there. If we want Celsius instead of Fahrenheit or vice versa, hit that bottom left button. That's pretty much it. You kick your hot water on, this system is going to kick on and start heating it and give you endless hot water. Over here we have a little fan on off and our vent open closed. That's for that kitchen vent to be able to exhaust out of there. In your kitchen on this countertop, you will notice you do have that GFCI protected outlet. This is one of those main outlets that I was talking about. If one of your other outlets doesn't work, you're not gonna go to your breaker panel, you're gonna come to here. Now we'll simulate as if the uh, system was tripped. You'll notice if it is tripped, you'll have an orange light that pops up right here. And then all we have to do is hit that reset button. The other button on here is test button if you want to test that breaker on here to see that it is working properly. If your unit, if your receptacle trips right off the back after you reset it, go unplug some of those griddles, coffee pots, whatever you might have plugged into those outlets, and then try it again. You may also want to check and make sure those outlets aren't wet as well. Those are the two main things that cause these to trip. In our kitchen, we will notice if we open that door, we have our 110 breakers right here and our 12 volt fuses. So we talked about any 12 volt components, they're all labeled right here. We know what to look for if something goes wrong, we can check these fuses and see if they're burnt out. Generally, you're gonna have a little red light in there if a fuse is burnt out. Our 110 breakers, obviously they'll be tripped if we have any issues with those. Once again, everything is labeled. You also kind of hear a little fan back here whenever you're plugged in. That is your converter system running. Converter system is basically a battery charger. It's going to be charging your batteries whenever you're plugged into that shore power and keeping them maintained. 
Down at the bottom of our island, we have that COLP detector right down here. We'll notice a little green light indicating that it is on powered up. That is a hardwired device into our 12 volt system. So anytime we have battery power, of course that system should be on and operating. It's gonna aware, make you aware of any cautious gases by alarming you, kind of like a smoke detector. You'll have that chirp. You do need to test that every now and again, pushing that test button. It's gonna go through a series of chirps and it'll let you know that that system is operating. Now these do have an expiration date on them, either on the front or if you undo the two screws, it may be stamped on the back. They're good for about five years. We do need to change those out when that time comes. Our kitchen table is extendable. We flip that up right there. We make sure that these latches are locked in to pull them down. We pull those down, down at the bottom, and we can just drop it back down. We need to make sure that we put that down before we roll the slide out in so we're not causing any damage. You're also gonna have smoke detectors in your unit that are powered by those nine volt batteries. You need to check and make sure that those batteries are in good condition and that system is working as well. Now we do have a residential refrigerator in this unit. They are going to be 110 power. That's why we call them residential. You're gonna have a different series depending on the type of unit, different series of operations on these. Most all of them are gonna have with that quick cool mode or quick freeze mode where it's gonna quickly cool down the refrigerator or quickly cool down your freezer and you can change your zone temperatures on that screen as well. Most of them are also gonna have a lock screen. You hold down that lock on there and then you can go and make those adjustments. They so do that, that way the kids can't mess everything up, right? So you're gonna have uh, mid drawers. It varies on what model and series you have on here. You'll definitely have that freezer. One thing to keep in mind when you go to store your unit, you're not plugged in, that system is going to defrost. So we need to make sure we get all our ice out of there, get any water that's in that system out, because if that water drains out and damages those wood components, manufacturers are not gonna cover that. So make sure that we are defrosting and cleaning out our unit. This is also going to uh, lessen the chance that you get any mold or mildew in your fridge. You're always gonna have travel latches on your refrigerator. You wanna make sure that you use those so that way your stuff doesn't come flying out and cause any damage and you don't have a mess all over your unit. 110 powered, once again, if that inverter system is kicked on, you don't have shore power, it is going to pull off your batteries and operate that refrigerator. All right, we have our 110 operated microwave, obviously, and we have a three burner stove right here with a glass top. We leave that glass top down for more counter space. Uh, when we are traveling, it always needs to be down, otherwise this glass is gonna fall and break. Under all of that, when we flip it up, we have our three burner stove right here, gas operated. Make sure your propane is on and you can turn the knob to that light option, hit your igniter, and then we can go ahead and light that stove top. Now we always want to bleed the air out of our propane system uh, before we go operate things like our furnace or our LP water heater. This is to help reduce the opportunity for any faults in that system. And we do that by coming to our stove first. So why do we need to bleed air out of our system? Well, anytime we pull our unit out of storage and we have the valves off on that propane, you're generally going to end up with air in the system or if you change the tanks out, once again, air in your system. Easiest place to do that is come to your stove and light it. Turn your propane tanks on, come to one or two of the burners, turn it to light and just hold that igniter button down until it lights. It may take a little bit of time because once again, that air is coming out once it lights let it run for about 30 to 60 seconds and you have a nice blue flame all the way around and then you can go operate those other items. It's gonna make them uh, operate a lot quicker and make sure you don't have any faults. Now this one is a suburban stovetop. Pretty much all of them are gonna run the same. You're also gonna have your oven down here at the bottom. Now your oven pilot, the only difference is you're going to have to turn and hold this button down on the pilot on option and that is going to allow, once again, we're, we're purging that air out of the system and we're uh, allowing gas to get into that burner tube. While we're doing that, we need to hold down that ignite button so that igniter will begin to try to light that pilot. We look down there, we see that pilot is lit. And once it's lit, we can stop igniting. Just hold that pilot down for about 30 seconds or so. And then we can turn to our temperature. We're heating up that thermocouple in that system to make sure that it knows, hey, we're lit. Otherwise, it will automatically shut off that gas valve and it will not try to operate. If it goes out, we just wanna go back to that pilot on option, 
push it down, and we want to relight that system. Now, I always tell customers, first time you light it, once again, if the air is still in that system, first time you light it, it is gonna take a little bit of time, even still for that oven pilot to light. So just be patient whenever you're operating it. All right, our entertainment for our living room. Of course, we have a TV. There is a port back here with two coax connections. One is going to be for your satellite, and we can hook a receiver there and then go to our TV. The other one is going to be cable and air antenna. Down here, we have our JBL radio with zones A and B to control your interior and exterior speakers. These being our interiors. And then below that, we have our 110 operated fireplace. That is gonna be an electric fireplace. We'll go over the operation of that now. Here we have our fireplace. We have a sensor right up here in the top right. We have to aim that remote at to turn it on. We have our Celsius and Fahrenheit temperature we can change to. And right here, this little flame icon is going to change the dimness of our flame. If we wanna change the lighting of our flame, we hit the light bulb on the screen down here at the bottom, and it'll give you some different options right there. If we wanna operate our heater on a timer, once again, electric heater, it is going to be this button right here. It looks like a clock. And when we push it, we can see some times pop up, one hour, two hours, three hours, all the way up to eight, and then it will go to zero hours, letting you know that that timer is off. If we wanna change our temperature, we'll use one of these two buttons at the bottom, and we can see once again, we have a temperature down there, and we will go ahead and raise it until it kicks on, or lower it, we want it to kick off, or we can keep going until it says on, and that heater will stay running all the time. We kick it up one more time, and it's gonna say OF, meaning that that system is off. In our hallway, we have our G thermostat for our living room AC system. We'll go over the operation of that now. This is our GE thermostat. We have several buttons right here. Our mode button, when you push it once, it's gonna bring us to the fan mode. Now this will turn the fan on and let it run all the time. It will not cool your unit. It just circulates the air throughout it. If we hit our fan button down at the bottom, we can see it goes from a higher speed to a lower speed. Hit it one more time with those two dashes that will bring that fan to the high speed. If we hit mode again, we will see our cool snowflake pop up there at the top. That lets us know that we are now in cool mode. On the right hand side, we can adjust our temperature to whatever we want. Now, if we are in the cool mode, we see auto right here. This will mean that the fan will turn off whenever the compressor turns off and turn on whenever the compressor turns on much like your AC at home. Now, during the hot, hot summer months, you're gonna to wanna to take it from auto and go regular into a fan mode on, generally in high. This will help keep the fins on that air conditioner dry in between cycles of the compressor, and this helps reduce the opportunity for that air conditioner to freeze up. So on any temperature over 90 degrees or so, I suggest leaving that fan in the on mode where it is running all the time. If we hit mode one more time, if we have a furnace hooked up to it, which is generally a gas plant, it will go ahead and kick on. And once again, we operate that temperature right here on the right. In our half mid bath, we have a toilet. We also have another GFCI protected outlet here. And then we have our fan off and on for our vent up top and light switch. We'll go over the operation of the toilet when we hit our front bathroom. All right, we're in our front bedroom and we have another air conditioner in here with a separate thermostat on the wall. That one is also gonna be GE. It's gonna be controlled just like our one in the hallway, except we're not gonna have any heat on this system. <clears throat> it's only for our main living room area, but it will heat this area as well. well. On this ceiling assembly right here, we do have these two tabs. We push those tabs, we can pull it down. We have a filter right there we need to keep clean. This is on both of our ceiling assemblies, including the one in the living room. We need to check that filter, keep it clean so we're not restricting air on our AC. Now we do have ducted units, so we'll have these vents in our ceiling that's going to transfer the air through our unit when that AC is on. And then we have our dump vent right here. So that dump vent is if we want to cool off just this area. We open that up, the air will come out of here and just cool this area off. It won't be going through our vents in the rooftop. We want it to go through the rooftop air, just close it off and it'll go. Once again, living room AC assembly is gonna be the same way. Now over here to the left, we have another backer for our TV and we have two, X, two coax connections. One is for our auxiliary satellite coming from those ports outside. If we wanna run an exterior satellite and then we have our TV connection, which will be for antenna and cable. If we're using cable, we just plug it in, scan for channels, we're good to go. 
if we're using antenna, we have to use that boost button. So that boost button is right there to the left of that uh, coax connection. We push it, the light turns off, push it, light turns on, little green light. If we're using antenna, that light needs to be on, so it'll help boost that antenna and help pick up more air channels. If we are doing cable, we need to make sure that light is off so it doesn't scramble those channels. Over here, we have our WineGuard gateway system. This is a Wi-Fi system. It is there to help boost any campground Wi-Fi that you have. If you purchased it through them, it'll boost it inside your RV. If we want to upgrade and have Wi-Fi with us wherever we go, we can win, visit WineGuard.com and get with one of their providers that can have a SIM card and you would be able to operate that system and have Wi-Fi with you wherever you go. All right, we're in our front bathroom. We do have another main GFCI outlet over there. Uh, just so you know, there is a second one in here. And just like the one in our kitchen, it's gonna operate the same. In our shower, of course, we have that hot and cold faucet in here, just like any shower does. But in an RV, uh, this little button on our shower head basically turns the shower head off and on, right? So we use that whenever we are dry camping. We're trying to conserve the amount, the amount of water in our fresh tank and the amount of water in our going into our gray tank. And we shut that shower head off in between rinsing and lathering up. And it keeps us from having to find that sweet spot on our faucet every time we shut that shower head off. It's just a convenient way of doing it. If you don't want to do it that way, you don't have to. Just suggestion. If you're hooked up to city water, you can go ahead, use those faucets just like you would at home. Your toilet, you got two of them. One, this one is for that front tank. The other one is for your rear black tank. And pretty simple. We have a little pedal on the side. We hit that pedal and it will flush anything that's in that toilet down the drain. Now if we're doing number one, just liquids, we can just flush it down, no problem. If we're doing number two, we got solids and toilet paper. We need to fill that bowl up about half to three quarters of the way. Well, we have enough water to push those solids down the pipes and we don't get them clogged up. In order to do that, we just barely depress that pedal until the water starts coming out, filling that bowl up. We stop when we get about half to three quarters of the way. And when we're ready to flush, hit your pedal and it goes down the tank. We do have an exhaust up here at the top. That exhaust is suggested to be used whenever you take a hot shower. That way you can get all the heat and humidity out of here and reduce the risk of mold and mildew in your camper. In your front closet here, you are capable of upgrading to a washer dryer system. You have the plumbing and everything right there on the wall. Well, we hope you found that resourceful, but wait, there's more information on our Great American RV YouTube channel. This channel right here, find the playlist HAPS Helpful Hacks. We go over different products in this unit and we'll take a deeper dive with more diagnostics, more information, as well as helpful tips when you're out camping. Tell your buddies, tell your friends, like, share, subscribe, do all those awesome things on YouTube, TikTok, wherever you found us. And keep watching here at Great American RV Superstores, where we bring the how-to to you.